London is not the best. Okay, yeah, you we'll need, start. You need, you need 5G. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, yeah. is watching on YouTube, actually. Yes, uh, it's okay, so we're... <laughs> Gentlemen, Very good, five so... and three seconds. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so welcome to our first panel on Society 5.0 for AR Global Digital Transformation Day. We are talking and starting with the panel Digital Transformation Society 5.0 for AR, how to make it happen uh, for cities and countries. And uh, I'm privileged to have a fantastic panel here. And I'm going to read a bit of the bio. So we have uh, um, uh, His Excellency Saifuddin Abdullah, the Minister of Communications of Malaysia. That will be the first, uh, uh, we're going to present a video from him. Then we have uh, Syed uh, uh, Junaid Iman, member of IT and uh, from the Ministry of IT and Communications from uh, Pakistan, and as well the CEO of the Digital Transformation Unit that I'm going to present. Then uh, His Excellency Alexander Bornikov, Deputy Minister of Digital Transformation for IT and Development of Ukraine, and Dr. Edwin Diender, Vice President of Digital Transformation for Hawaii, but as well a thought leader on his own in these areas of digital transformation and working with a lot of countries. So I want to start with a small bias because we have amazing bias here. So day to Saifuddin bin Abdullah um, is the Malaysian politician and Minister of Communications and Multimedia and the member of the parliament for Indera Mankota. And he's also a member of the ruling Pakatan Arapan coalition. And he's as well been working and creating a lot of solutions and actually uh, pushing the concept of Malaysia 5.0 that we have as well in the panel that is mostly looking at the ideas of transforming Malaysian society to become a more digital economy and as well looking at solutions on these areas, especially when it comes to optical fiber, cable manufacturing, digital of uh, the FTTH network, optical transmission backbone in private sector and all the active different areas of uh, his experience in the country. And then in terms of uh, um, uh, the areas of uh, uh, the second speaker, uh, so Syed Junaid Iman is the member of IT for the Ministry of IT and Telecom of Pakistan, and as well as the CEO of Ignite National Technology Fund for Pakistan. Junaid has an academic background in the field of electronic engineer with over 23 years of broad-based experience in the field of IT and telecom, and he has done some pioneering work in Pakistan in the field of embedded system development, optical network design. Management consultancy in Europe and the early of his career has been associated with research and development organizations in the public sector. So uh, welcome. Uh, then we have uh, um, Alexander Bornikov. Um, Alexander has received the first degree in marketing Kiev National Aviation University in 2004. Then he continued his studies in the University of New Brunswick in Canada and received an MBA in 2009. In 2019, he graduated from Columbia Business University uh, of New York with a Master of Public Administration uh, degree. At the age of 26, he founded Ad Intelligent, a video ad monetization platform. And Alexander is also an entrepreneur and uh, co-owner of Intersog, an international software outsourcing company. Of course, right now, leading the technology and digital transformation for Ukraine, which is a country very powerful in uh, software development and different areas. And as well, has been as well uh, Deputy Minister of Digital Transformation since 2019. Then, uh, last but not least, Edwin Diender. So, um, a researcher is actually uh, with an MBA in international business and marketing and a PhD in the areas of business economics and sustainable business models. Edwin is considered a thought leader and blue ocean strategist for both Hawaii enterprise, but as well been working with the global government business units and as well leading digital transformation for the, the one of the leading corporations in the world, but as well is a thought leader on his own with a lot of essays and papers published all over the world. So I think we have a great panel. I'll let you uh, go in a while to talk. I appreciate and I am grateful to have you all here. So I will start with the, the first video. Uh, uh, the Minister of Communications on Malaysia sent us a video. So I'm going to share my screen. So just give me a second. And we're going to start with him. And I think the questions I ask him to answer is how Malaysia is looking at digital transformation. What are the challenges they're looking when it comes to new technologies and emerging technologies? 
And now is Malaysia being prepared for all the challenges that come out of these areas? And as well, the concept of Malaysia 5.0. So it's been talking for six minutes around these topics. So I'm going to put the video and I'll share right now. Sorry, I think we have an issue with the sound. Uh, so I'm going to take my earphones. So sorry to see if you can actually hear. Sound. And I'll start again, so I apologize. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, businesses were hesitant to invest in digital technologies as they felt that their long-term productivity gains may not compensate for the high initial cost in acquiring advanced technologies. SMEs, especially in East Malaysia, had to face digital adoption challenges, mainly due to the inadequate infrastructure, resulting in issues relating to connectivity and quality of internet access. To alleviate the effects of the global pandemic and to encourage more digitally skilled Malaysians and digitally powered businesses, the government has implemented an economic growth plan consisting of both fiscal and policy measures called the National Economic Recovery Plan or in short Panjana. The National Digital Infrastructure Plan or in short Jandela and the recent National uh, 4IR Council the social economic development of the country through the use of advanced technologies. Malaysia's culture of openness and the critical discussion around the implications of digital transformation require us to support technology that enables people and creates genuine value to them. We're also asking ourselves, what can we do to live in the kind of world that the technology we are building can serve and enable us? Our policies and standards include strategies that, number one, adhere to a set of United Nations Sustainable Goals, uh, the SDG uh, 2030, EU AI Alliance and universal principles that guide our technological and business strategy decisions. Number two, invest in building technology that promotes responsible data usage and management. Number three, employ and empower a team of privacy and civil liberties uh, researchers, uh, technologies and engineers. Number four, work with leading global think tanks and universities. And number five, engage with independent experts in privacy law, policy and ethics. In fact, in a way, the COVID-19 pandemic has emerged as a game changer for digital transformation. The Ministry of Communications and Multimedia Malaysia through its agency, i.e. the Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, or MDEC, is leading the country's digital economy forward by focusing on creating inclusive and high quality growth through the nationwide digitalization initiatives 
that are in line with the government's shared prosperity vision 2030 and our goal to firmly establish Malaysia as the heart of digital ASEAN. In order to accelerate Malaysia's digital economy nationwide and in the region, the ministry, together with MDEC, is stimulating digital adoption within SMEs in a wide array of business sectors. This initiative includes, among others, Digital Accelerator Virtual Platform. The platform helps SMEs gain access to available programs, incentives, and technology solutions that best match their specific digitalization needs. An SME Digital Acceleration Program, which is a business transformation accelerator program that digitally empowers businesses, namely by providing a structured approach to adopt digital with outcome-based results. And then there is the Smart Automation Grant, which is a matching grant for services companies that help automate their business processes and move towards digitalization. The purpose of this grant is to help them kickstart the development and implementation of projects that drive the adoption of technologies to automate business operations. And we have the SME Digital Quick Wins, which is a platform that focuses on facilitating the process of connecting technology solution providers with SMEs to properly tackle and overcome the challenges that these businesses face with digital by implementation free or discounted digital solutions. And then there is this e-usahawan, i.e. a platform that provides courses that impart digital entrepreneurship values and knowledge to micro, rural and youth entrepreneurs to foster income generation and increase sales at the broader national level. The Malaysian SME Master Plan 2012-2020 endorsed eight measures to further boost SME's GDP annual growth, and they are namely intensify digitalization of SMEs, enhance SMEs integration in the supply chain, increase support to more SMEs with high growth through relevant incentives, increase SMEs readiness and competitiveness in adoption of innovative, disruptive, compelling technology and business model, facilitate alternative financing for SMEs, recoup external SMEs value chain into the country to drive growth strengthen uptake and promote export of homegrown payment gateway and fintech by SMEs and enhance SMEs participation in the tourism industry. Finally, premise on the National Entrepreneurship Framework or the NEF, which is in parallel with the eight measures for SME. The National Entrepreneurship Policy, the NEP, has been formulated to bring about a comprehensive, inclusive, and holistic entrepreneurship ecosystem for SMEs in the country. So I think we have a great ambitious strategy for Malaysia and legal disclosure, I'm, I'm partly involved, but I think it's a, a great uh, program. And as the minister mentioned, there's an ambition to try to focus on the SMEs and all the strategy of innovation related to that, which I think it's a great way to go. So, um, I would like to go right now to Siad Junaid um, uh, Iman, member of IT uh, from the Pakistan Minister of uh, IT and Technology, and as well uh, an expert in these areas. So welcome to our panel, and I would like to more or less listen about some of the things and opportunities. I know Pakistan is a, a big country with a huge population, very young, and a huge amount of SMEs as well. For instance, Malaysia is around 1 million SMEs. You have around probably 4 to 5 million. So it's quite a big number. So I would like to hear a bit how you are tackling these subjects and as well your vision to the country. Uh, your sound, you have to take the mood, please. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you mentioned, Pakistan has a large population, over 220 million, fifth largest in the world. Um, and 60% uh, of our population is youth. Uh, but we, if you look at our GDP per capita, it's less than 1,500. 
so uh, we understand that the potential we have the numbers of uh, per capita income and other indicators do not reflect the true potential that we have so uh, and we also at the same time realize that if we want to utilize our youth and uh, the human capital that we have uh, we have to transform pakistan digitally and we have to shift to a knowledge based economy where we can uh, use our uh, human capital to the best of their potential so uh, realizing this fact uh, uh, government of pakistan uh, developed a vision for transforming pakistan uh, digitally and uh, for this transformation uh, we had uh, looking at our challenges we had uh, five or six pillars uh, that uh, we have identified that we have to work on if we want to transform pakistan digitally and uh, the first one is uh, accessibility and uh, uh, we have a challenge here in pakistan our uh, current broadband penetration is around 40% so uh, uh, 60% of our population does not have access to the broadband so in order to uh, transform digitally uh, accessibility is the key so uh, we are focusing on uh, providing the uh, broadband penetration to the uh, rural areas uh, we have challenges there uh, uh, pakistan is a poor country and in the rural areas uh, the business case is not there for the operators to go so we are uh, building different schemes subsidizing the operators to go into the rural areas so that uh, the 60% uh, of the population can be brought onto the network so that's uh, one aspect that we are working on uh, the second uh, one is uh, the hr development uh, with relatively low literacy rate, uh, we understand that's uh, another focus area. We have to uh, improve our uh, literacy level, and then we have to impart uh, uh, technical skills uh, into our uh, human capital so that we can use them uh, to develop new applications, new services, uh, adopt new technologies. So HR development, it's uh, one of our focus areas. Uh, in which we have um, uh, initiated different uh, schemes. We are uh, providing uh, digital skills to our citizens free of cost. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we are also having programs to uh, impart uh, uh, trainings in the emerging technology area as well. So that's uh, one aspect uh, we are focusing on. Uh, the third pillar that we have is uh, R&D and innovation. Uh, I think uh, we have a key focus uh, on uh, innovation uh, in Pakistan. Uh, we have uh, initiated many incubators, accelerators. Uh, we are funding uh, startups as well uh, because we believe that uh, uh, we can transform our country with uh, tech interventions. So, uh, and for those interventions, uh, uh, the focus on the innovation and uh, promoting the youth, uh, that's the key focus area of the government. So uh, innovation and R&D is one focus area. And then e-governance. Um, we have had challenges in the past uh, of the governance and I think uh, uh, economic prosperity has uh, a direct linkage with the governance as well. And we believe that uh, adopting digital technologies in governance will bring uh, transparency and efficiency in the governance. So uh, one focus area of the government is to uh, uh, transform the basic uh, and uh, all infrastructure and uh, model of governance to e-governance. So that's a focus area. And then another aspect is financial inclusion. Uh, uh, we still have uh, uh, a lot of uh, cash transaction uh, in the country and uh, to document the economy and to uh, make uh, these uh, services available to uh, every nick and corner of the country, uh, we believe that financial inclusion is necessary. And again, uh, the infrastructure, uh, that's one important part. Then on top of it, we need to have uh, regulations, policies where we facilitate uh, the masses and the companies, businesses, government uh, to tr uh, transform uh, to online activity, uh, bring everything uh, in the ambit of law and uh, document everything. So that's uh, financial inclusion again, uh, it's an important aspect uh, that we are working. And then we have a focus area on uh, software uh, and other uh, development uh, as well. Um, uh, if you we look at Pakistan uh, currently, we have a very ideal scenario where uh, uh, our uh, bulk of our population is in the rural areas. Uh, 
where uh, we have lack of uh, services in terms of uh, medical, um, um, health, education, agriculture. And uh, in the urban areas, we have infrastructure, we have uh, experts, we have technologies uh, in these areas. So it's an ideal situation for, uh, for us that uh, once we are establishing the con connectivity between the two, uh, the demand is there in the rural areas, the supply is there in the uh, urban areas. So uh, we just have to connect the two and we have a very business, good business case uh, uh, for uh, providing services and uh, these tech companies to use uh, digital infrastructure to provide services. Uh, that's a very uh, key focus area for the uh, uh, government. Uh, if we look at our yields, uh, as far as agriculture is concerned, uh, it's uh, really poor. And uh, if you look at the health services to the rural areas, again, uh, we have challenges there. So uh, this is a, a broad area and uh, uh, we are promoting these areas to the foreign investors as well, because there are many low hanging fruits uh, in these areas with uh, a minimum of uh, investment and uh, pitching it right. Uh, we can have a win-win situation both for the investors and uh, for the government, for the service, uh, for the citizens, where they can get uh, cheap, good quality services at economic uh, and economical rates. And at the same time, government will fulfill its obligation of providing uh, basic services. The businesses will get uh, their fair share of uh, uh, revenues out of it. So uh, we see a win-win situation for all the stakeholders uh, once we transform it uh, into a digital economy altogether. Uh, uh, we are facing some challenges as well. Uh, I think uh, uh, in a developing country, change man management uh, is an issue. Uh, people generally have resistance to change. So uh, that's uh, one uh, focus area for us uh, to work on. And then collaboration and partnerships uh, between different stakeholders, uh, government and private sector. We believe that uh, if we have to successfully transform and this cannot be done um, uh, primarily by the government itself. There has to be a good public-private partnership model established and uh, the private sector should have confidence and uh, a good working relationship with the government uh, so that we can exploit the opportunities out there in the uh, country uh, for both businesses and for the, for the government itself. So that's uh, uh, one uh, focus area that we are working on uh, and, and that's the key. So uh, uh, overall, uh, we see we have a long way to go as far as our digital tr transformation journey is concerned. Uh, but uh, we have put ourselves uh, on the right track and uh, with the uh, provision of right uh, interventions and uh, with collaboration of all, all the stakeholders, uh, we can see that uh, we can uh, get good benefits out of uh, the new technologies and can work for the citizen of Pakistan. And then we look forward to such forums uh, and we are collaborating with other countries who have, uh, have advanced uh, in digital transformation, who have achieved some successes. So we are also collaborating with them to learn from their experiences and uh, adopt it according to the domestic needs. So uh, yeah, overall, uh, we see a good future ahead uh, in this era. And once we transform ourselves to a knowledge-based economy, uh, we see that uh, for the people of Pakistan and uh, in a global community, we can contribute good. So with this, uh, I would thank you, Dennis, and look forward to any questions. Thank you. No, very, very important. And I think it's important, like you said, it's a massive population. is a country very powerful and a lot of young population. We really need that. And I think that's why we're doing this event and hopefully we can actually get more ideas. So, Alexander, I would like... Uh, um, to um, uh, to pass to you, so understand. I know Ukraine uh, is a very powerful country in terms of software and technology, but in terms of the country, what are your work and what are your initiatives on this area? Well, yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone, and uh, I would like your permission to share my screen. I mean, share the presentation. Um, yeah, I think go to yeah, done. And. Uh, I think you can see it, right? Um, yes, it's already live. Make me, let me uh, do a view. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so Ukraine is a pretty big country and uh, we have 
a lot of US ex USSR legacy in terms of bureaucratic, and that's why uh, our ministry of uh, it, it, it's called Minister of Digital Transformation because our goal is kind of transform um, the whole economy to digital economy, and. Um, um, I'm going to tell you what are the, how we've been making this, what are the goals of the ministry, so you will see it by yourself. So uh, actually, uh, our ministry was formed like a year ago, so it's it's brand new ministry. It has never existed before, and uh, it's it's solely responsible for transforming all the uh, relationship with, between citizen and government. Uh, with uh, its 4 uh, IT industry in Ukraine, which you mentioned is really powerful, and I'm going to talk about this later. Um, we also have created recently, a year ago, um, a, a parliament committee. Uh, it's also called Digital Transformation Committee in the Parliament, uh, with the deputies who were, uh, who are in charge of uh, legislation of certain uh, things that we need in order to uh, digitally to be transformed. Um, and also, we now we started appoint um, uh, the roles which we call chief digital transformation officers across Ukraine. Um, just want to mention that Ukraine is uh, 35 million people, 35 40 million people, and uh, with their like six major, more than one million cities, and uh, and we are. Uh, from the, from, uh, on the west, we border with Poland and on the east with Russia. So we're a pretty big country. Um, so uh, when ministry was just created, we specified the goals uh, and we divided on the four parts. So the first part is make 100% of the government services available online for all citizens. Then, uh, of course, uh, uh, my colleague from Pakistan mentioned this, and I also can uh, I also can say that we have a similar problem. There's a problem with infrastructure. We have a lot of rural areas in, in Ukraine too, and uh, we also want to cover it with broadband, high-speed internet. So that's that's another thing that we do as a ministry. Another goal is, of course, to teach people digital skills because if you move uh, all the services online and you give them access to infrastructure, but they don't know how to use smartphone. What's the point? So that's another thing that we do. And um, the last goal, which, which I'm responsible for personally, it's uh, increase uh, share of IT in Ukrainian GDP up to 10%. Right now it's between four and 5%. So it's actually double uh, income from uh, high technology export and uh, high technology production. So those goals are, but we're ambitious and uh, we started from uh, moving basic papers, people papers into the smartphone. We created mobile app and this mobile app allow people to uh, keep their driver license, their passport, their birth certificate, birth certificate of their children, uh, car insurance, um, car titles, all in smartphones. So, uh, and, and, and it was tremendous success. In in a couple of months, we reached this four million people downloaded our app and started to use it. So now you can actually create a business online in Ukraine. Uh, you don't need to drag along all the papers with you anymore. So uh, you can, I mean, you can internally uh, use internal flights without any uh, papers in, in your pocket. Um, and it's really became um, a most popular app for the all the time uh, app for the all the time in Ukraine since the, uh, we got our independence 20 years more than 20 years ago. Uh, recently, we also uh, enabled like document sharing, so you can basically um, uh, share the copy of your passport in a digital form with any entity that requires your identification. So you come to your entity, they ask like uh, your confirmation of your entity, you take your smartphone, then you just pass your digital copy of your passport, they get it, they scan it, I mean, um, they scan the code, QR code on your smartphone, and they get your digital copy of your, uh, of your ID. So uh, this is our the major project that we do in the ministry, and uh, we have huge uh, plans going ahead. So uh, one of them is in a year, 
uh, next September, September 2021st, we aim to completely get rid of the papers in Ukraine. So uh, in a year, no one from the government side will be allowed to ask paper from the, from, from the citizens. So this, this, is, this is our goal and we are uh, going to make it. Um, I mentioned that uh, besides application, we have, we, we have created a portal with the government services. And uh, uh, for, for instance, you can, uh, you can open your business. Uh, one of the great things that we uh, finally implemented is when, uh, 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 when a mother deliver a baby, you don't have to go anywhere else. You, in 20 minutes, you can get all the paperwork on your infant including insurance, uh, state help, uh, even his tax ID number, everything in 20 minutes. Before you had to go to, to 20 different uh, institutions for like a couple of months. So this was done in just less than a year. Uh, and I just wanna point out that we don't digitalize current bureaucracy. We completely redefine the experience in interaction with government. Optimize procedures, get rid of their bureaucracy and make it very simple and transparent. Uh, uh, some of their services, for instance, we have uh, construction permits. So if you wanna build something, you have to get construction permits. So we make it available online and uh, we completely em eliminated human factor. So there is no, um, government uh, representative anymore. So this is completely done, done automatically. Um, and many, many other things. Um, so I, 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 and for in IT industry, I just wanna give, wanna give you some insights on digital skills. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about what we propose to IT industry. So uh, we created national online platform uh, where we make, uh, uh, educational lessons for for the for the people of Ukraine, and they uh, and already more than 266,000 2, people use this uh, platform. Uh, they uh, they they look uh, on the on on those videos, and uh, we created lessons uh, so we, you can actually uh, test your skills. And then we issue a certificate if you pass all the exams and, and the skills online. We issue certificates that you. Uh, digital skill level is uh, appropriate to use uh, um, government services online. Um, we created a DA business project, which is a national platform for entrepreneurs, how to start the business, how to conduct business, how to get the, the, the help from the government. And uh, we continue to uh, establish uh, uh, offline representative of this project because people want to come and see by themselves. But of course, COVID situation, uh, slightly slowing us, but not completely, we're not completely stopping. Um, and uh, about digital economy, we came up with a project called DACD, is a free virtual economic zone. So it's, it's a kind of high, it's, it's a technology, sort of a virtual technology park. So you don't have to go uh, uh, to a specific place, you just register and you get tax discount, discounts, you get um, certain protection from the government, and uh, like, in, like British law, for example. And uh, this is not uh, live yet, but we are in process of creating. Another thing that we also uh, decided to go on it is, is with cryptocurrencies, virtual assets. Ukraine is gonna create conditions to launch and, and develop virtual assets. So it will be totally legal to use them. We also came up with their artificial intelligence uh, concept and strategy and uh, on, on the official government level. And the last thing, but not least, it's electronic residency, which is basically opportunity to uh, people from around the world uh, not uh, open a business in Ukraine, but not visiting Ukraine actually. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop here. And uh, I think because I, I <laughs> yeah, I did my time. Uh, so thank you, and I hope this was insightful. No, well, congratulations. I think it, it's great to be in these events to understand how innovative uh, all of your countries are doing. And I think especially it's really important and seeing what you're doing 
and actually promoting it worldwide. And I think we need much more of these initiatives. So I'll pass the word for the last uh, keynote speaker. Uh, so Edwin, you have been working with a lot of countries and a lot of uh, cutting edge technologies. I would like to have your opinion, probably more on the personal research level, but I think as well in the corporate head. Sure, and thanks for the opportunity to um, not so much uh, share knowledge, perhaps. I think for today, it's more important to compare notes because um, all of us in our past have been taking notes in all these different meetings and all these different initiatives. Um, so comparing notes would probably be more interesting to do, uh, but we're virtually, so that means we have to turn our notebooks around and you know let you have a look at all the things that we've written down. I'd like to follow a... a, a a three-step approach in the coming 10 minutes, if you don't mind. And these are based on uh, the inputs that were provided up front before we've joined uh, this session. One of the things that we've asked to put our head around or to get our head around for is what are the biggest challenges that we are facing when it comes to digital transformation and to the respective society? What are those biggest challenges? And I think the previous speakers have addressed those for their respective countries pretty well. I'd like to applaud uh, each of them um, including the, uh, His Excellency from Malaysia uh, for a very simple thing. And that simple thing sits with having an initiative or having a drive to take things by the hand or move things higher up a value chain. We hear that from the speaker from Pakistan. We clearly see that in the programs and the initiatives that are in place and that move Ukraine certainly in a shorter time frame, much higher up the value chain than if it were not digital. But the, His Excellency from uh, Malaysia also mentioned that there is a digital agenda. And the good thing that I think, so not a challenge, but the good thing that I hear in all the speakers coming back is that they do this because it fits society and society means people. So it's for people. Uh, I really love the example of uh, 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 giving birth to a child and then having to go through different agencies and institutions offline independently. They don't share information versus maybe even on the birth bed, um, as, the, um, as, as mom is uh, holding the baby, probably dad uh, is a bit overwhelmed by all these emotions, so probably wants to put his mind on something else. Very good, dad. Take a computer, take your tablet, and register your young born child uh, with everything on it and for it and with it. I think these are very clear examples where the people are involved. So a challenge today for digital transformation sits with not having the okay not having the involvement and probably also not having the understanding of the people that it is for. A second challenge, I think, and some of the speakers addressed that uh, briefly, is that most systems that are supporting us today are sitting in, in silos. They are verticalized, they are inward looking, they are proprietary sometimes. Uh, if it is a digital stovepipe or a digital information system or a digital version of systems and services, that it's not linked to anything. It only supports the department that has been deployed for. So a second challenge that, that slows digital transformation down and doesn't bring it up the level where it can be, or I'm not saying where it should be, but where it can be, is that information stovepipes are slowing it down. And that brings me to the third point. It also sits with regulations. The amount of paper trail, red tape, bureaucracy, as uh, Mr. Alex from the Ukraine mentioned, um, where he, I think, uh, again, applauding you, uh, greatly says, uh, let's jump a curve, as Guy Kawasaki would say, for, for, for um, uh, 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 disruptive innovations. Let's not innovate and let's not drive and digitalize what we already have. Let's just jump one or two curves, create a very good thought process, have a good vision, and then digitalize whatever can be digitalized from that standpoint and not digitalize bureaucracy, if you don't mind, sir. I would like to use that in my next keynote speech that we should not use sure. or, or not do digitalization of bureaucracy. I, okay. I love that uh, because that's also where it sits. The amount of organizations and also countries and government services that are still depending on a person in office that needs to go to the office because at home, it's probably not allowed to sign off paperwork. Someone really has to go to an office, has to go through paperwork just like you see presidents sometimes for ceremonial purposes see their signature 
uh, written down on a piece of paper or on an amendment or what have you, but that really is the case. So if there is a digital initiative, if there is an initiative and a program that says, let's take this piece of a city and let's try to move that higher up the value chain, let's digitalize specific services, then that is a decision that can be taken very fast. Uh, a, a program team can be esta established quite swiftly, but then the sign off requires someone with authority to really, you know, take a paper and put it on a put it on a take a pen and put the signature on a piece of paper. Sometimes these approval processes on paper are more than a quarter, more than two quarters sometimes. So by the time the approval is through the process and the program team has to start or can start or budget is released, new initiatives are available, new technology is invented. The existing technology where the approval was needing for is overruled or became obsolete already because it's just like buying computers in the in the computer store right now for children who have to who need a computer for their homework if daddy says okay it's saturday i got the day off let's go downtown let's do some shopping and let's get you a computer for your homework the moment you buy it you got a computer that's probably already a one year old version you're getting updates and upgrades that are a quarter behind and that's for a student computer which should be the best so technology usually is behind so if the paper trail does the same doesn't go further. Then what do we and what do countries do? So what countries are doing, I think we've heard from the previous speaker very, very well, how and what they do to embark on this process, to embark on this journey and to improve the pieces. Because one of my mottos is uh, uh, technology should allow us to do better what we already do best. I think that that would be the main purpose for technology to do. Uh, and anything else, I would debate that's not good technology if it's not doing that. Um, but th th that's a side note. But the second part sits with, if there is technology available, um, like a platform, for example, uh, a digital platform or a technology platform, or maybe the principle of a platform that can overlay and that can bridge these different information silos that speaks perhaps the different machine languages and the different version, so software version languages of all these different systems that already are out there and that can overlay it and that can bridge them and can leverage, then that would be a good starting point as a foundation to move forward from. So your step zero would be to overlay the information systems and to break down the silos. And step, step one would be, what is the first program to deploy? What is the next initiative to go forward with? And line that up, maybe not as a roadmap, but maybe as a travel guide, because digital transformation, as far as I'm concerned, is a journey. And that brings me to where we are as an organization. We put in place systems and services, platforms and ecosystems. So platform and ecosystems combined to help our partners and our customers with their digital journey. Part of my job is actually to actually help our customers and our partners with their digital journey. And the principle of a platform is usually what we take as a first step. A platform that can speak that can speak these different languages and that can incorporate perhaps the new ideas as we go forward in the digital transformation process. And last but not least, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, everybody speaks about second wave or third wave. I was not aware that the first wave already was gone. Actually, to me, it's a pandemic, and the pandemic is there, whether it goes up and down here and there, but it's not solved yet. So, what are the implications to? organizations? What are the implications to the journey of digital transformation? I think, and I have to say this, unfortunately, the pandemic has driven, has speed up, I think, parts of this digital journey, uh, which we didn't anticipate. For example, uh, the guideline at some point was we close office and we all start to work from home. Um, that means that my home office, which maybe did not exist, had to be established. Uh, my kitchen table where I used to check my email now becomes my office table in my own kitchen. Uh, my children have to go to school, but they go to school online. So remote learning is taking place in the same space. Uh, maybe my life partner has other businesses going forward. So all of a sudden as a family and as roommates and as sharing the same household members, we are confronted with working from home most homes are not designed for that. So that's a challenge number one. Challenge number two, the connectivity, and it was mentioned before as well by the previous speakers, the connectivity in a home is not fully utilized to work 
from home. Certainly not for everyone in the home to work from home. Maybe one or maybe 1.2 person can use it. So the burden on global and mobile infrastructures to be upgraded, to be utilized, to be also transformed and able, and able to cope with this additional burden for a longer time where all these mobile networks and global networks were not designed for is another challenge. And the last challenge I think with COVID is how do we, how do we circle back if we wanna circle back or how do we go back to the regular office? How do we go away from work from home to work in the office again? I think also there we will find new challenges uh, because the existing challenge in existing office environments is uh, we need to have flex desks, uh, sit where you like, use the device of your choice, uh, regardless of your location, uh, 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 technology agnostic, the high performance work, uh, workspace, the knowledge worker workspace, uh, open office space. I think that we're all implemented to create an office space that fits society as it is, or as it was, because after the pandemic, when we go back to the office, I think an open office space is not gonna cut it anymore. We need to get these cubicles back, I guess, uh, because we wanna create some distance, but also not much. Uh, I recall many, many times when I'm in the office that if I wanna have some information from my colleague or my peer, I would just go to him or her and I would ask, I would go to the desk or I would go to their office. I think right now, if we would go back to the office again, another challenge would be, can I send a message just like I do right now? Say, hey, are you available? And then there's a chat or an instant message coming back, say, yeah, sure. So it's, it will be Zoom meetings in the office instead of between offices. It will be Zoom meetings between your colleague who's, who maybe sits two doors down the hall because of social distancing. Um, and another thing which I think sits with, men, uh, with a mental challenge uh, we are not really very well designed as human beings to go through all these changes too much. And that creates uh, a burden mentally, mentally speaking, so to speak. I think we are not having as a society enough attention. And I think we cannot have enough attention, but we should have also as leaders, as, as business owners, as governments, as, as society to not only tell each other, um, stay healthy and stay safe but i think i think stay sane is a part in our vocabulary that we have to incorporate and that we have to be careful about because uh, things like burnouts uh, people who just don't deal with things the way they were supposed to or they thought they could but because of the distancing are not visible anymore as a team leader you cannot see how your team is doing if the whole team works from home you have to find another way to get your head around how is my team doing and maybe I should get some guidelines in a mechanism or in a framework that says, this is the rule for today. We're not gonna do after 6 p.m. meetings anymore. You have to turn around from your kitchen table and you gotta watch your family members and you have to have your dinner. Because in a digital world um, where everything is with uh, Zoom meetings and what have you, it is very easy to say yes to every question because you don't hear much. If you're in an office environment, there's a lot of people around, you have a coffee break, you, you know what goes on in the different departments, you can anticipate you are involved and informed. But if you work from home, you're not. So the more questions you're getting from colleagues saying, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? Probably gets your calendar filled up with activities too much. And, and we have to find our place to rest. So stay healthy stay safe and stay sane should be something that from a digital point of view, we, we should perhaps or could perhaps also incorporate into being uh, more prone to what our challenges are, how platforms and systems and services allow us to create environments where we have a keen eye for that and where we are able to evolve and step out of it and move out of it and progress uh, to create a better society as we already have. Thank you, Edwin. So a lot of points to, to put on the top of uh, the thing. So from, and of course, like you mentioned, there's mental health care, but as well cybersecurity. And of course, we have a panel about governments and cities. And for instance, all of us probably are right now streaming from home or from places that are close to that. So it's not the, an easy challenge as well. So um, so one of the things I would like to highlight, so I, from the notes of the, the Minister of Malaysia, there's a big ambition to make the country digital first. And there's a lot of things they're doing on that direction of uh, creating Malaysia 5.0. Uh, 
um, as well as yeah, the Junaid. I think you mentioned a lot, and I would like probably the first question to you. So Pakistan is a country right now with a new government and a lot of challenges, uh, but as well, a lot of opportunities. Like you mentioned, a very young population, um, a huge population as well, and a huge potential for growing the economy. So these parts of the digital transformation can actually enable the country to create new business models, new sol solutions, but as well comes with a lot of different things. So in terms of the things you mentioned, Let's say, would be, what would be the things that you are right now prioritizing? And let's say for international organizations and people like us, they're looking at Pakistan, what would be your note for these people looking at the country from outside in terms of these areas? Okay, uh, so uh, I think one of the key area is our G2C part. Uh, uh, we have lagged in the past uh, providing services to citizens, but we firmly believe with uh, the use of technology, I think uh, we can uh, fundamentally improve on this. And like I mentioned, uh, health, education, uh, agriculture, in, in these segments, there is big rooms. So we are now making policies and we are facilitating uh, tech companies to come to this business area and invest and uh, uh, they will uh, get their returns and uh, the government will get uh, the required services to the citizen. Uh, I think related to this is our uh, startup ecosystem. Like I mentioned, uh, we have big gaps in service delivery uh, in Pakistan. So uh, right now, uh, there are a lot of small companies coming in where they, they have niche markets in this different segments uh, and uh, what they are just doing, connecting demand and supply. Uh, I think that's uh, the, the communication that uh, the lack of communication in the past our infrastructure uh, that has created a gap between the demand and supply. So uh, I think connecting the two uh, will uh, create a lot of businesses. And uh, at the same time, um, like our rural parts, 60% um, of our population is in rural areas. They don't have access to the international markets. There are good skilled people there. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different range of products that are being made in the rural areas. Uh, and I, I think uh, uh, platforms, already local platforms have uh, capitalized on it and they are bringing them on online platforms where they can be marketed. But uh, what we see, there are some international players also coming into this business area where they are leveraging this, uh, these local businesses as well and tapping to those unique uh, products, unique services that our untapped areas are providing. So uh, it's creating good business for them. So uh, uh, I think our startup uh, ecosystem is now flourishing and there is a lot of opportunities for invest, uh, international investors to tap into it and uh, get benefit out of it. So uh, I, I think that's the area which is open for the investors. No, thank you so much. And then, um, Alex, in terms of the work of Ukraine, then I think you guys have a very ambitious program. And of course, like you mentioned, and I like, like, you, like Edwin highlighted, the idea of not digitalizing bureaucracy, I think is a very good, powerful thing because unfortunately, we tend to bring to the digital twin and uh, age all the issues that we have in the real. So what, how are you coping? Because you have definitely one of the biggest uh, software development capacity in the world. Are you as well leveraging this? And for instance, you mentioned as well the international capacity for international investors to have a relationship and international uh, even partners to have a, a direct relationship with Ukraine without even having to go there. Can you explain a bit that? Right now. I'm sorry, you, you, you're, broken, you're breaking up. Uh, as I, I heard, can you explain and then you... you... Yeah, so I will repeat. So uh, I was saying, well, see, I'm in London, but London internet is not the best. But uh, uh, I was saying that uh, in terms of uh, the, you mentioned the program that you're doing for international uh, organizations and companies and even investors to have a presence in Ukraine and collaborate with Ukraine, even without needing to be there. That is a quite a very bold move and I think very important with, uh, with COVID-19. First, I have a lot of negotiations with countries that if I'm not going there, it's difficult to do anything. And it's, we cannot stop. <laughs> the world cannot stop. So I would like to highlight that. I think it's a good example and probably you need to promote that better internationally because it's a big thing as well. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, we do have plans to promote it. Right now, uh, we, all did, we did all the job to on the legislation level. 
because of course it, it, it's requiring a lot of things to change. For example, one of the uh, things is uh, how to open bank account online. So we spend a lot of time with their uh, bank regulator, with the National Bank of Ukraine. So they changed a lot of procedures. And, and finally, they, uh, uh, they made it. So now if you want to open an uh, account, bank account in Ukraine, an Ukrainian bank, you can use remote identification procedures. It is not allowed before. And uh, so, so but, but still we need to come up with a technical platform. And now this is, this is what we do. And I think it was gonna be the first quarter uh, next year when we release the platform. Basically what we offer is just you, um, you go on a website, you um, first you install smart ID, we call it smart idea. So it's smart ID, it's, it's basically an application that allow you to use electronic signature. So you register, you, use, you apply your electronic signature. We uh, remotely assign you um, a tax identification number. So it's a unique number that identify you as, as, a, as a taxpayer in Ukraine. Once you got this number, you, uh, you're able to, uh, so you got a confirmation after let's say three days, you got a confirmation. And after, uh, once you've got a confirmation that uh, tax ID number is assigned, uh, you can open uh, two sort of uh, businesses. First, it's like a, you, you can be registered as a private entrepreneur and pay 5% uh, like a turnover revenue tax. We call it the unified tax. So 5% from all you got in your bank account. Or you can um, uh, open a, a, another type of entity which, which is basically a lim limited liability company and, uh, be, and become a subject for, for 18% uh, income tax, uh, which we want to uh, uh, make two times less. So we, we now uh, speaking with Minister of Finance to decrease it to nine percent. So uh, and once you register this entity, uh, you able to we, we give you a couple of banks uh, as an options. So you can go and uh, you can online apply for bank account, and if if everything is fine. Uh, you you have bank account attached to your entity, and then we allow you to once you start connecting business, we in, inside this portal. Uh, so it's on on the website. Uh, once uh, once you start conducting business, you'll be able to uh, kind of see uh, tax reports. You can uh, com uh, combine tax and then come up with it, uh, create the tax reports and send them remotely because of course. Our tax administration will want to have some reporting too. So that's, that's basically a very quick explanation of the workflow. And um, uh, as I mentioned before, it will be uh, available in the first quarter of next year. Well, congratulations. I think it's a great initiative and I think, I think every, every country should follow. <laughs> so I think definitely I would like probably if you could send some links for us to promote oh, because yeah. I think it's really important. Um, so we are, I'm conscious that we're passing one hour now. So Edwin, just probably a last question for you. So you're working with a lot of governments um, and uh, without going to the corporate part. So what would be the, the biggest challenge you have with the, with the countries you're working, especially in a lot of the things we're talking here? Well, w without being too specific, um, usually when you work with governments, you have to deal with politics. So that's, a, I wouldn't say that's a challenge, that's a given. Um, and, you know, each country has their own different set of politics um, and governance. Uh, so navigating and being able to link and, and create um, and keep momentum between all stakeholders is, um, is an item to, to just bear in mind. Um, what I also think is very admirable is that each government that I've been uh, working with, um, as I mentioned in my, uh, in my speech, uh, do have a digital agenda. And some of these digital agendas are, are just comprised, uh, are at the early stage of being completed. Uh, but the majority of those digital agendas are actually quite complete, um, quite substantial, um, and do take things from a bigger picture um, looking at a further place beyond the horizon as a point to go forward to and use that as a direction and then create travel guides and not roadmaps to move forward. Uh, the last thing that I think I can say about this is 
also processes and also ways forward are still um, in the current comfort zone, so to speak. What I mean by that is there are still public tenders, there are still RFPs, there are still projects to be done, and there are still budgets to be assigned. Uh, in my view, that is the old economy, uh, economy way of thinking and going forward that really fits a physical version of an economy, the digital economy. And I'm sure Mr. Alex from Ukraine, but also the previous speakers can confirm that from their point of view and their uh, 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 ways of looking at it and, and, and their uh, ways of being confronted with challenges. Having a digital economy requires a digital way of processes and probably programs and initiatives fit better and funding and financing fits better than having a budget that needs to cover a cost or that creates uh, or that works with a price rather than values and benefits, which is where the digital economy is more active in. So bridging these two worlds, um, probably the principle of a digital twin that you mentioned in your introduction would not be a bad idea, might, might even be the thing to put in place as something that can bridge both physical and, um, and, and digital um, to at least understand it and to be more predictive and to provide uh, inputs and alignments as we go forward. Because today, all the principles of physical and the physical economy, I think it, 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 it fits a bit with what uh, Mr. Alex said, where they don't want to digitalize bureaucracy. I think, that's, I, think, I think it comes in that same corner or it sits in that same corner of thinking, I guess, a physical economy and then taking principles out of it and trying to apply it as an approval process or, uh, or, or a project team or a project going forward for digital transformation. Th there is so many mismatches in that, th th that you're working longer in trying to make it match than that it actually serves its purpose, which is move higher up the value chain in a shorter time frame. So th th I, think th I think that's what we can say about that. I think we ran out of time, but I would still like you guys, if possible, to get a bit of a one or two minutes about uh, each of you about the, the biggest challenge. I think, Siad, you mentioned about fintech and financial inclusion, as well, the rural reality versus the macros uh, in, in Pakistan. Alex, you mentioned a lot of innovative things. So from the, the out, uh, outside countries and people that can actually invest or at least engage with the um, Ukrainian economy. So... What would be like, uh, let's say, for someone listening to us, and we have people from all over the world, and a lot of these videos will be streamed much after this event and reach probably thousands of people, even millions going forward. So one of the things I would like to know is, let's say, from Pakistan perspective, which is an emerging economy, although it's a powerhouse, but as well with a lot of challenges, to you, Alex, which is a country as well with a lot of power in some areas, but as well, people from outside might be afraid of a lot of different things. And as well, Edwin, from your lev lever of both working for a Chinese global multinational, but as well you being Dutch and as well a citizen of the world, which I think it's important as well to look at this. So if you could just two minutes about how do you see these areas, in the context of your work in your countries, uh, probably start with you, Siev, and then Alex, and then Edwin. Uh, well, uh, uh, what we see a lot of opportunities out there because uh, historically uh, we have not had many success uh, as far as the digital transformation is concerned. We see a lot of opportunities uh, in uh, our government to citizen services, uh, our G2B uh, services. We are bringing in uh, different platforms so that uh, to provide ease of doing business. Uh, I think that's the key that our focus area is that um, uh, even in the, this COVID area, our IT exports have shown uh, uh, a very good uh, growth rate. So uh, uh, I, I think. Uh, uh, the tech part, uh, the human capital that is avail available in Pakistan, uh, I think uh, we are also capitalizing on it and we are uh, making uh, some uh, good use cases for the public and for the investors. So I think uh, investing into the startups and tech startups, uh, which are based on our uh, human capital, I think that's a good area uh, where uh, anyone can come in and capitalize. There's a good business case for them. Oh, fantastic. And I think it's very sharp. And I think this is key for any investor because the first thing they want is exactly that. And I think that is the most important thing, because if you don't feel confident about doing business in a country, you run away. And I think that is key. Um, Alex, from your side in Ukraine. Uh, you are on mute. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm back. Uh, so our vision is to 
um, like if, if we speak in terms of investors, we uh, our vision is to create uh, in Ukraine the most powerful um, IT hub in Eastern Europe. I think we have all the capabilities. We have brilliant mind, and uh, Ukraine is famous for resolving complex tasks. We we uh, we are less uh, we're smaller from human capital perspective rather than Pakistan, for example. But uh, we definitely have. Uh, uh, experience in resolving uh, most complex tasks from from IT uh, and digital uh, area. So, so this is our vision, and uh, we do all, all do our best to give uh, this perspective for people around the world and uh, uh, building all the ecosystem, uh, including startup ecosystem, venture funding ecosystem, in order to be complying with that uh, vision. So that would be short. Yeah, and I want to highlight, I think you mentioned a very good point uh, that I think uh, one of the notes I have from your uh, presentation is that uh, the percentage of the IT part of the economy is very small, which I thought would be much bigger. And I think this is something that just shows the opportunities and the challenge we have, because in the end of the day, we look at the best, the biggest corporations on the planet are technology companies, but our economy, especially our countries are still not technological so it's a big opportunity and i think it's a great point yeah thank you very good and i think it's a great element and when it from your experience with the countries and i think like uh i know that you've been working probably with 20 or 50 countries or more i think there is probably some frames uh or i don't know depends on the countries but i know that uh, especially from the corporate element what would be like uh, and as well for instance if you look at china in the last 10 years china became one of the most advanced economies, probably the most advanced economy and most advanced technology. And it was in the space of 10 years. And 10 years ago or 15, they were a very poor country. So from a, from a GDP and so forth. So things are possible to do. Of course, there's different ways of doing it. And I don't want to go to geopolitics, but just from a perspective of digital transformation on the positive side, what would be the highlights to summarize? Well, there's a few things to say about this. I think the easiest one is it starts with a vision and having an, a team of people that are able to execute on that vision. Uh, if that's not in place, it really doesn't make sense at all. Uh, in case of governments or in case of countries, let's, let's talk about countries, not so much about governments. In case of countries, it has to be a, a vision that covers the country border to border and maybe even cross border. Uh, so the role of a country in relationship to the continent, perhaps that it is part of or neighboring countries. Uh, just like one smart city is not a smart city, it's a network of smart cities that does it. I think one smart nation is not a nation. Uh, it's a smart nation in, in relationship to other connected nations. So leadership, uh, an executive team that has the ability to execute on the vision. Secondly, I think you need to find strong, not only technology, but different forms of partnerships uh, that can further accelerate this journey that you're embarking on. You need to find uh, a good funding and financing uh, baseline and you have to start. So what to do and what to do first, start small, but think big, advertise every small step as if it is the biggest thing ever achieved, because that creates the awareness and the willingness for people around it to be part of it. As I mentioned earlier, um, it is for people, it is for the society. If you're forgetting about them in the beginning, it doesn't mean that it is all ending. You are able to get them on board again, as long as you advertise your success and show the value of everything that you do for society, because that's what it is for. Uh, doing better what you already do best, I think is the best way to repeat it. So a great way to wrap up. So I wanna thank you all of you for your participation and the fantastic insights. And actually I think it shows as well that all of your countries and representatives are really doing a fantastic work. And I know sometimes we things going on and I think that's what I, I at least that's what I tell my team and the people I work with we need to focus on that so congratulations to all the work I know that is not easy as well to do what all of you are doing and um, hopefully we're going to be building a bit a better world and a better nations and better cities thank you so much